The thing that emerged um, from our research, which was surprisingly positive in some ways, was that the the sorts of policies that you want to kickstart the economy, you know, those policies uh, and recovery package elements, the, the green ones, do that really well. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academia from all over the world and it will explore the hottest topics across the energy market. It'll be hosted by various experts from Aurora and will give a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to the latest episode of Energy Unplugged. I'm Richard Howard, Aurora's Research Director. In this episode, we'll be discussing the topic of green stimulus. And the context for this is, as countries emerge from the coronavirus lockdown and take stock of the severe economic impact that they have seen, many countries around the world are discussing how to reboot their economy with significant stimulus packages of economic measures. At the same time, with the net zero and two degree climate pledges, Many commentators have said that perhaps we should try and emerge in a different way from this crisis to to how we went in and really focus on policy measures that can both reboot the economy whilst curbing our um, emissions and our environmental impact. This is really the focus of the discussion uh, in this episode of the podcast, where we'll be looking at this whole topic of green stimulus Uh, both in terms of the rationale for a green stimulus and also how, what are the best policies um, that governments should be pursuing. I'm very pleased to be joined by Cameron Hepburn, who's a thought leader not only on this topic, but also wider economic and environmental issues. He really needs no introduction, but for completeness, is the Professor of Environmental Economics at the University of Oxford, the Director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, Um, and the uh, Director of the Economics of Sustainability Programme, both at Oxford, and uh, was the co-founder of Aurora, as well as uh, other successful businesses in the space. He provides advice on energy and environmental policy to governments and international institutions uh, around the world. Of particular relevance to this podcast, Cameron and his team have been undertaking research on precisely this topic of green stimulus, um, in which um, they've reviewed um, policies from around the world and reviewed the literature on which are the best measures to be pursuing um, from both the perspective of rebooting the economy and reducing emissions. So welcome and pleased to have you, Cameron, on this episode. Thanks, Richard. Very happy to join the show. Cameron, could you say a few more words about the research that you and your team have been doing, both in terms of the scope of, of work and how you pursued it? Yeah, sure. I mean, the paper was commissioned by uh, a journal called the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. And we have a big issue, the journal has a big issue coming out in just a few weeks on the economics of the coronavirus pandemic across a whole range of issues. And this is the paper for that issue on climate change. It's joint with uh, Nick Stern of the LSE, Joe Stiglitz of Columbia, Dimitri Zengelis of Cambridge, and Brian O'Callaghan from Oxford. And the question that we set out to answer is, will the pandemic accelerate or slow down action on climate change? Because it was not clear, and actually it still remains unclear, whether this could be a tipping point in a positive direction for action on climate, or whether it could really derail our efforts. And in order to try and get to grips with that question, we obviously had a look at all of the data from satellites and from economic data coming in from the IMF and the uh, and other multilateral institutions on the immediate impact. But it becomes pretty clear fairly quickly that the biggest impact is likely to be in how we respond to the pandemic and in particular what these recovery packages are going to contain. And to try and Nail that down, because of course that's you know, literally a work in progress. I've just come off a call with Chinese policymakers. Uh, we tried to, well, we did a survey of 231 officials, mainly from finance ministries and central banks around the world, to get a sense of what sort of policy elements they saw as being favorable. Uh, and, and we did that in order to get 
a bit of a forward look as to as to what might happen here in a in a descriptive sense. Uh, now, of course, once you've done that, you end up and reviewed the literature and you reviewed several hundred other policies from the past. You end up with a sense of what is uh, normatively a good idea. So, so what should countries do? So, so the paper also goes into those sorts of questions as well, and we published it in early May. Thanks, Cameron, for for the overview. I suppose maybe then if we start by recapping on what has been the impact of of the coronavirus lockdown, both from an economic perspective, I guess, to to talk through which countries and industries have have had the biggest hit, Um, but then also from an environmental perspective, what has been the impact on on emissions and and on wider environmental um, indicators? What did you find through this work? Well, it's, very, it's very interesting because you might think that the virus, um, you know, it's hit everybody. Everybody's affected by this. If, if you look at the Oxford uh, index of um, policy response and severity now, basically 100% of the world has been affected by lockdown in some fashion. But the impacts are highly differentiated. They're highly differentiated across country, across sector, across uh, individual um, men and women uh, are faring differently, young and old are faring differently. And so you do have to get granular. So, you know, at the, at, but let's start uh, overall. I mean, we've seen um, quarterly impacts to economic output of a scale of 20 to 25%. On an annualized basis, uh, the various estimates, you know, IMF, OECD are around the 5% mark. Uh, my guess is it could be a bit higher than that by the time you account for the potential for second waves and so on. The impact on um, countries like China is a bit lower. They've managed the virus pretty well. They had prior experience uh, with these respiratory issues. So they locked down pretty quickly. Their track and trace is working well. So, you know, the OECD's estimate of the impact on China is two and a half percent for the year, which, uh, which interested readers can see these and other stats in an Aurora paper, Richard, coming out soon, called Green Shoots. Uh, whereas the impact on a country like India will be higher, you would expect it to be higher still on the states or a country like Brazil. So it's very different across country. And then different again, as I say, across um, sector. So there's a, a really lovely paper by a group of physicists and economists at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at Oxford that have looked, have constructed a network mapping of the economy and something they're calling a remote labor index uh, that is tracking the impacts across um, sector. And, you know, if you're in education or, you know, the sorts of things we do, our productivity is affected because some of us have children and have to look after them too. I've got three. But, but we can more or less get most of what we need to get done done by working uh, some longer hours. Whereas there are many other industries, you know, where, where face-to-face contact is required in healthcare, or some of that can go digital uh, in uh, you know, some of the more um, construction-based work where you just simply have to be working physically with other other people. So they've had a look at the impacts on uh, different sectors there. And what they've found is that um, some industries like the transportation industry have had a big hit on the demand side. Other industries like manufacturing, mining and related services have had a big hit on the supply side, you know, they can't actually do their jobs. And then there are other uh, very unlucky industries that have been hit on both sides. So, you know, entertainment, restaurants, tourism, these are sectors where you've got a double whammy. You you can't actually deliver the service in some instances. And on top of that, people don't want it because they don't want to be next to others in close proximity or, or, or to be traveling. So it's very differentiated. And it, it seems to me sort of anecdotally, but also what I've seen of the UK government data that the industries that have seen the bigger hit, um, so sectors like leisure, tourism, um, retail, are more concentrated in the low medium skill levels, whereas some of the industries that have been hit the least uh, tend to have more of a concentration of, of medium and high skill levels. So it's in general, it's um, it's low to middle skill workers who've been hit hit the hardest and, and low and middle in, uh, income households as well. Does, is that borne out in other countries? 
Yeah, that is borne out in the data. You're absolutely right. I mean, there are obviously some uh, some exceptions and some tweaks, um, but it's broadly, unfortunately, broadly true that those you know least in a position to to bear the force of this shock end up bearing. And I'm afraid to say that I mean it's yet another parallel with the climate challenge uh, that those least able to manage the hit um, seem to be likely to take it in, on climate as well. As a segue there, um, on the environmental side, I, I believe we've seen something in the order of a, a, an eight. Well, it's expected there'll be an eight percent global fall in uh, in greenhouse gas emissions for for this year as a result of of the lockdown. Is is that still is that still the latest figure? Broadly speaking, yeah. I mean, there's half a dozen different estimates now uh, with various ranges. Probably the best is from Corinne Lequeres' group. Uh, uh, in the Global Carbon Project, I think is the name. But yes, that, that's the, I mean, I, I would say somewhere in the 5 to 10% range looks like a good bet. Yeah. So that's, I suppose, a summary of what we've seen um, to date. Um, but I suppose going back to the, the kind of context of this discussion, I suppose this, as you put it yourself, Cameron, this this is what we've seen so far. But really the the part that where this becomes more interesting for policymakers in terms of the policy response is is really about how we emerge from this um, crisis and how this um, relates to the the overall sort of net zero ambition um, for the UK. Could you comment more on that aspect? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the thing that emerged um, from our research, which was um, surprisingly positive in some ways, was that the, the sorts of policies that you want to kickstart an economy, you know, to get investment going, to get the animal spirits as Keynes put it back, to re-establish confidence and investment and hence jobs. Um, you know, those policies uh, and recovery package elements, the, the green ones, do that really well. So um, you, what you're looking for, a big, chunky uh, spending that is often on infrastructure, whether it's physical infrastructure or natural infrastructure, you want it to be labour intensive, you want it to be relatively quick moving, and at the end of the day, um, you know, you don't just want to dig holes and fill them in again, as much as that would get the economy going again. You, you want to have a, a lasting, valuable asset that's fit for purpose in the world that you're moving into as a result. So, you know, as we have jokingly said, you dig a hole, plant a tree and fill it in again. And um, so you know, we found that there is a, a set of green recovery policies which perform particularly well on the economic dimensions. And of course, you know, it's not as if um, you'd only do it for economic, short-term economic reasons. I mean, we've kind of, we've got to get to net zero anyway, um, in the UK by law and globally by physics, uh, and, which is arguably the stronger of the two, not to diminish my colleagues in the law faculty. Uh, but uh, we, so we have to get there anyway. We might as well not put good money after bad uh, and invest it into insecure fossil industries where both the, the capital assets and the jobs associated with those assets uh, are likely to be insecure and instead redirect the effort into building the economy that we want of, of future decades. So the, the broad kind of case, I think, is, is pretty compelling. Um, but there's also lots of detail to get into. So in a sense, I just to put some sort of numbers around that. So we've seen the 8% fall in in emissions or expected in in 2020 and, and my understanding is we basically in order to hit net zero need to do something like that every year now um in the period to 2050 whilst simultaneously getting the economy back on track and so in a sense whereas this period will be characterized by lower economic output and lower emissions we need to in the future do the trick of decoupling and and have the lower emissions but whilst the economy gets gets back on track that's that that's sort of broadly broadly my understanding of of the challenge which seems extremely difficult but i suppose from from the evidence um you gathered and the um the the interviews the, the survey with all of the the finance and economic ministries what what were the specific policy areas that that came out best I, I guess against that twin challenge of getting the economy back on track but reducing um, emissions are there, are there some that you can call out as, as being particularly favorable yeah um, sure and, and you put it very nicely Richard that you know we, we need a, 
uh, 7.6, I think, percent per annum fall in emissions every year to 2030 to, to be on a one and a half degree path. Now, I'm sure many of the listeners to this podcast um, won't expect us to be on a one and a half degree path. Uh, but it does show the scale of the challenge. It also shows something which I've certainly thought for a very long time, which is that behavior change alone is not going to do it. Getting uh, to a, a stable climate clearly requires massive supply side and technological progress uh, and change. Uh, and the behavioral and the demand side, you know, um, nobody wants to have their lives curtailed and their jobs lost and no sensible environmentalist thinks that this is a good outcome. So, you know, this is not the way to do it. Uh, the way to do it is to keep the economy humming and high productivity, high prosperity, and to reorient the supply so that we, so that we do it cleanly. And to answer your question, um, the policies that really emerge from the survey with, with strong desirability uh, assess, as assessed by the respondents were those that actually contribute very well there. So th these are things that, you know, listeners to this podcast will, will know and love. There's an awful lot of clean energy infrastructure that still needs to be rolled out, both in the UK and around the world. It's not just the wind and the solar and the storage and the hydrogen. It's grid upgrades. It's the upgrades of charging networks, uh, all the associated infrastructure around a net zero economy has to you know, appear uh, in the course of the next couple of decades. And, and there's really no better time to get going on that now. The second bucket is uh, around energy efficiency. You know, that the scale and the size of that infrastructure that I've just spoken about in the first bucket can be smaller uh, if we are not wasting our energy and our electricity. And we still do an awful lot of waste in this country. So there's, there's still really... Um, I think it was Steve Chu who said, this is not low hanging fruit. This is fruit that is sitting on the ground rotting. <laughs> we, we need to pick it up before it does. So um, energy efficiency is a big one. Uh, another uh, big area is actually around the natural infrastructure base. So one of the other things that we know, but don't like to talk about too much uh, in terms of getting to net zero is that basically we're too late uh, for to, to, to get there on time without also taking large amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. You know, the, the, the moment has passed where we could uh, really say that we can, we can just move ourselves in a gradual, steady, economically rational way. And the, the reason is we've just, we've just invested in too much fossil infrastructure. So we are going to have to shut down a lot of that infrastructure early. But in addition, we're going to have to take CO2 out of the air. And there are various ways of doing that. Many of them involve the land and how we use land, how we uh, get, get our um, soils enriched with carbon, how we plant different uh, ecosystems and, and trees. And the benefits of a large natural restoration project uh, is that it not only provides uh, you know, these uh, carbon and environmental benefits, provides resilience from floods, uh, ecosystems and habitats for biodiversity, mental health benefits to, to people, and also lots and lots of jobs. So that's a, that's a big third bucket of, of policies that um, made a lot of sense. And, and then quickly, fourth and fifth, I mean, on the fourth uh, bucket, this is around the longer term benefits of research and development uh, in clean technologies. This is not a huge one because um, while its economic multiplier is massive, it, it doesn't you, I mean, there's only so many scientists you can suddenly wave wand and produce and then productively deploy. So it doesn't operate on a scale of months and it can't operate at absolutely massive scale, but you can scale it up and we clearly ought to be doing more and we should be thinking ahead there. And then finally, very importantly, if you've got you know, 40 million people out of work in the US, 100 million people plus out of work in India, this is a great time for thinking about retraining people uh, and including the UK, so that we have the set of human skills that map on to the new sets of physical assets that we have to have deployed. So when, when you're unemployed, it's a great time to go back to school or to learn a new trade, and uh, the government should be thinking hard about, about doing this right now. That, thanks, Cameron. That's a great summary of, of some of those 
those top measures. I suppose one question in my mind, uh, I, I kind of wonder where some of the tensions lie um, within these policies and also between these policies and, and other uh, other more general sort of stimulus policies that, that governments may be thinking about. I suppose one question is about the speed of impact of these policies. So it, is it the case that um, the this set of policies, you, you mentioned five, which seem to tick the boxes on the emissions front and and economic impact front, um, do they have? W- will they have a quick enough impact on the on the economic side? Will will they be creating jobs within the next um, twelve months, for example? Yeah, I mean, with twelve months, yes, yeah, so, I uh, would definitely. Some of them will. Some of them will operate much faster than that. I mean, potentially, you know, a matter of a month or two. Um, some of them won't, and you know this is a—it's um, getting a balanced portfolio of interventions uh, that we, we're after here uh, to take um, to take what's already happened. You know, we we have had three months of lockdown already. We haven't seen uh, massive recovery policies in place just yet. What we've seen are what what we're calling rescue policies, which is just to keep people alive and eating and and businesses that are solvent coming along. Uh, and those sorts of policies tend to be purely financial. It's about getting cash into people's pockets and in, into onto the, you know, the cash balances of businesses. Those policies are, are not particularly um, green. In fact, they're not brown either, except insofar as they perpetuate the status quo, which is brown. So, but we're describing them as colourless. And, and those colourless uh, policies that we've seen so far have acted very, very quickly. Now, the recovery policies don't have to act very, very quickly. They have to act, you know, some of them have to act fast because there are people literally without jobs looking for them. Um, but what you want is a, is a scaling up of labor utilization as quickly as possible uh, over the course of the next one month to 12 months. Uh, and you can get this right by using a combination of these green policies and other policies. But I, I think you probably, you know, you don't want to have 100% green. Um, recovery on broader economic bases, and we're certainly not going to see that anywhere in the world. Yeah, and it seems within the policies you've you've outlined some, uh, such as the R and D, have a potentially a, a longer lead time, um, but others, uh, such as some of the natural capital enhancements and, and energy efficiency, could actually be scaled up um, pretty rapidly. In in a sense, uh, and on the energy infrastructure, I mean, there's there's, there's parts of the. Uh, the energy industry, such as solar, where we've actually seen significant job losses in in recent years um, for the rooftop solar in, in installations, which um, presumably could could come back quicker. There'll, there'll be skilled people out there who who could be redeployed in in that kind of activity if, if and when it comes back. Yeah, I might just pick up on, if I may, pick up on that point because it's a good one. Um, one of the interesting features of renewable energy is that it's very labour intense in the construction phase, and then actually requires less labour than fossil uh, energy in the maintenance and operation phase. So, so it's kind of lower labour productivity at the start and much higher labour productivity at the end. And what you want in a recession is you know, low labor productivity. So to some degree, you, you want lots of jobs. But then once you're out of recession, you want, um, you know, you'd ideally have all of these assets you've, you've created just humming along without lots of uh, labor so that people can work on other productive mm, uh, ways of spending their time. Uh, and in fact, it's, I mean, renewable energy is unusually well suited to the current moment for, for those two reasons. Yeah, no, that's very interesting, which um, so in a sense, by making those investments now, we're we're sort of concentrating the jobs in the next uh, few years, um, but then benefiting. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, I suppose um, one one question, maybe more controversial, um, is what your thoughts are on whether some of the the brown industries, um, uh, as I think you're characterising them, should get a bailout um, through this process, and if they do, whether there should be green strings attached in, in some sense. I, I suppose to give the most extreme example, obviously the air, airline industry is is hurting pretty badly at the moment um, with the very severe reduction in, in the number of flights um, taking place in the last few months. And, and actually the, even the prospect of, of flight numbers coming back um, n- not looking good. So quite a slow recovery from coronavirus potentially. Um, should should the airlines be getting a bailout, and and if so, should the government be forcing them to to act on 
decarbonizing their activities? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I'm kind of at odds with many of the respondents to our survey here who, uh, they were immensely critical of aviation bailouts, uh, saying that it would, you know, such interventions wouldn't have very high economic multipliers, wouldn't act very quickly, certainly would be very bad for the climate. That, that bit I agree with. Um, but I think economically, you know, it's a, um, it's not a stupid policy to maintain connectivity and trade. Now, of course, even better is to make sure that you've got your clean connectivity measures in place. You know, you've got 5G, you've got your broadband that's super fast everywhere. I mean, these things are much higher priority than, than moving humans around. But, but economically, it seems very valuable to have a thriving aviation sector. So, you know, I, I'm not against bailing out the aviation industry. But, I mean, as you allude to, I think if you're going to pump public money into a, a particular you know, private sector, or semi-private sector, then there, it's reasonable to ask for something in return. And if you think about what to ask for in return from the aviation industry, then there are a bunch of things you might uh, ask for, uh, you know, some around the financial arrangements of what happens when you put uh, funds into them, you know, how's it structured, is it equity, is it debt, et cetera. But, but also, we know on a climate uh, dimension, this industry has not exactly been covering itself in glory. It's not that it's not hard, it is hard, uh, but it's also not that there aren't solutions. There are lots of different solutions that are uh, available, some already, some emerging. And I think what we've seen ha has been a pretty unambitious uh, set of targets from the industry, as, uh, which is I'm sure you know, probably most uh, listeners know, the Corsia arrangement means that they can um, keep their emissions uh, from now through, you know, through to 2050, and they're just offsetting the growth, which is a long way from a net zero uh, strategy. So, so they need to lift their game, and I think it's right for us to ask them to do so. Yeah. Well, one final one. So I suppose, um, is there a good synergy or a conflict between the sorts of policies that you've advanced here and and the uk government's kind of leveling up agenda so if if these policies are creating jobs will they be in the right places will they be in the hot spots of economic activity such as london the southeast or, or will this disperse economic activity um, around the regions do you think well it's a bit of a mix so the, the natural infrastructure ones um clearly do disperse activity all around the country and you know, whether it's um, forestry in the north and in Scotland or whether it's water management or the various trials on greenhouse gas removal, you know, you're not going to do that in London. And, um, uh, and quite, a lot of, quite a lot of what's happening there is very exciting and it is up north. Um, then in many of the clean infrastructure um, elements, they're, they're a bit of a mix around the country, uh, but also in some of the uh, richer southern urban areas of the UK. Um, the education and training intervention is is clearly one that you know isn't isn't London focused. That's for workers all around the country. Uh, and there are um, you know there there are efficiency measures to be put in place wherever people live. So um, there are more of them to happen in in buildings where there are more people. But actually, there's plenty of people living actually in colder climates up north where there is a greater benefit and payoff of going around and making sure that they're living in nice, warm, modern uh, buildings. So it's a bit of a mixture. Yeah, yeah. But connects. I, I saw um, Michael Gave as well talking about trying to uh, potentially shift or oh, part of the government's agenda to, to reform Whitehall is, is around shifting some of the decision makers around some of these things uh, to the the very communities that are likely to, to benefit. So that seemed to signal uh, the idea of moving uh, some government department activity uh, out of London um, and, and with specific references to some of the decarbonisation um, activities here in government. So yeah, potentially that seems like quite a strong potential there. Uh, I suppose just to wrap up, um, Cameron, so if the UK were to pursue um, a successful green stimulus package. I mean, there seems like there's every likelihood they will. Uh, the, their own, the government's own MPs are, are calling for it. Business is calling for it. And 
uh, green groups and so on. Uh, so it seems it seems likely that the government will now pursue some form of green stimulus package. Uh, but I suppose what if they do, what will the UK look like in, say, five to ten years time? And um, what, what impact does this have on the economy, on our fiscal position, on our environmental position and, and even on social um, outcomes and social trends? Are you able to offer a few thoughts on that? You know, it's inevitably speculation, but but I think on the uh, on the broader question of whether the UK government will go in this way, I, I would agree with you that it looks very likely. I mean, um, I joined Alok Sharma for his uh, economic recovery task force, and there was a very strong consensus, a really quite notable consensus on that group around the direction of travel. Uh, we at Oxford have just um, submitted. Uh, a brief into at the, at the uh, following a discussion with the minister, Mr. Kwateng, on on hydrogen. We know there's an announcement coming there. There's a fantastic Aurora report out on hydrogen, Richard, which you may or may not have had something to do. So uh, th there's a lot of action here, and I, I was I've been called up in front of the Environmental Audit Committee too, uh, where there's real, you know, th this isn't a question of um, should we do it. It's how should we do it now, and I think that's very promising then how does that translate into what the world looks like or, or what the UK looks like in five to 10 years time? Well, I think a few things will be different. Um, obviously the trends in electricity, which are just very exciting, uh, will, will continue in terms of um, increased rollout of clean electricity, uh, increased um, cost, continued cost reductions. I think we've seen from number 10 that you know, we're, we're not likely to have a a period of fairly messy austerity. Um, I mean, balance sheets will be stretched. There's no doubt about it. it will, will be, they'll will feel under pressure in a couple of years' time by the time all of this spending has happened. But it is worth remembering that, you know, the, the government can borrow at negative real interest rates now. There is no imminent sign of inflation. So I think it would be a a mistake not to use this moment to borrow to invest, not borrowing for a consumption binge, but borrowing to invest for the future. And I think what that will mean is that uh, we will see, uh, so five or 10 years time, let's, let's think about 2030. By that point, uh, or shortly thereafter, we will be into a world where all new vehicles are electric or zero emissions, at least, um, passenger vehicles. Uh, there'll be the charging infrastructure, I think, will be significantly expanded from what it is today. Our houses will be much better insulated by that point in time. I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, whether we're all using heat pumps or hydrogen or still uh, conventional boilers to heat our homes is more of a moot point, as, as I think many people will know. Um, but then, of course, a, a lot of uh, a lot of how the UK is doing depends upon how the rest of the world is doing. And, and there is a real risk in the coming year or two that if we don't have a sensible coordinated response here, we will slide into uh, not just you know, a global recession, but a global depression. I, I, that's far from certain. I think it can be managed, but, but you can't uh, ignore the fact that there is a risk of that. And if we end up with a global Depression over the coming few years, then um, yeah, everybody suffers, uh, and and the UK will suffer as well. So so that is the the first priority here to make sure that the recovery is strong, uh, that it's sustainable, and also that it's in inclusive. So we don't have um, major political and societal level disruption. I mean, there's al already a lot of anger, a lot of inequality, a lot of dissatisfaction in many countries. The big kind of macro concern is that uh, if we don't make this inclusive, um, the, the very fabric of our social contract starts to fray and, and then you're in a very messy era. But if we can avoid that uh, in 10 years time, I think we'll be in a reasonably good position. Yeah, so some some very big challenges there, Cameron, I think. Um, you're absolutely right to focus, I think, on the government as being in in listening mode now to they've gone past the point of, of thinking should we should we have a, a green stimulus but it's really about how should we how should we do that which are the best um policies uh so um we at aurora will be um 
as Cameron has mentioned, it, um, we'll be giving some of um, our own views on that uh, in a forthcoming report uh, entitled Green Shoots, uh, which will be um, out in mid-July. On the hydrogen question specifically, uh, which you mentioned also a minute or two ago, uh, we have released a, a major report uh, on that topic looking at um, what a hydrogen economy could look like um, and which concluded that hydrogen could serve um, between a quarter and half of our total energy needs um, by 2050 and um, if we if we really push um, forward um, in in that direction in, in creating the infrastructure to uh, to generate and, and distribute hydrogen and um, so potentially uh, a very significant part of our overall energy mix by 2050 should uh, should the government wish to, to go down um, that track but there's a huge amount that would need to be done uh, to put that in place and um, so yeah that's a, another very key um, topic to be um, talking about at the moment. Um, so we'll we'll wrap up there, but I think Kevin, that's been hugely um, helpful and, and insightful, um, and it's clear that you've thought about this um, this set of questions from many different directions. Um, so it's been absolutely brilliant um, to have you uh, on the episode. Uh, thanks for all your contributions, uh, and we'll end there. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. That was Richard Howard, Aurora's research director, speaking to Cameron Hepburn, professor of environmental economics at Oxford University. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.